So I think we've given given a, the go ahead from tech that everything is up and streaming where it needs to be streaming. So uh, I am Lisa Engel and I um, nominated Robin, uh, Dr. Robin Mazumder for the Illuminate Speakership um, in conjunction with the key so I think speakership we've given for the Masters of Occupational Therapy Critical Inquiry Research Symposium that is being held throughout the day today. And uh, Dr. Mazumder's uh, uh, speech is, or lecture is called Pushing Boundaries and Creating Space in Healthcare and Social Policy. But before we go forward with that lecture, I do want to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba and where I'm sitting in my home uh, are located on the original lands of the Anishabe, the Cree, the OG Cree, the Dakota and the Dene people, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. And so I do respect the treaties that were made in these territories and acknowledges the harms and atrocities of the past. Um, as, as we are becoming more and more aware of the atrocities, um, uh, which is kind of on the mind of our country right now, but have been known for a long time. Uh, we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities. And I think as part of that being allies and accomplices in um, aiming Canada towards having more autonomy for Indigenous folks over their own lands. And so this is uh, Dr. Robin Mazumder is our speaker today, um, and I'll introduce him just now. So he's an award-winning urban neuroscientist with a keen interest in understanding how living in cities impacts well-being. And his PhD research, which was funded by a Vanier Canada Schol graduate scholarship, used, used wearable technology in real and immersive settings or reality settings to examine psychological and physiological responses to the urban built environment. And his research interests are informed by his clinical experience working as a mental health occupational therapist in the urban cores of Canadian cities, including Toronto and Edmonton. So Dr. Mazumder's hands-on clinical experience in conjunction with his training in urban neuroscience uniquely positions him to collaborate with scientists, practitioners, policymakers, and the public to create healthy urban environments. And he's also an outspoken advocate for the urban design that supports well-being and has given more than 30 keynote lectures internationally on the topic. He is passionate about science communication and has been interviewed by and written for major media publications, including BBC, CBC, HuffPost, and Wired Magazine. So I just want to give a little bit of a story of how I saw, how I learned of Dr. Mazumder's work. So sometime during my PhD, while I was living on the 19th floor in 600 square feet with a cat, a partner, and a baby, I became a doctor, aware of Dr. Mazumder's work and his focus on the environment and mental health. And I was just starting out on Twitter, so I quickly followed him. And his posts have uh, over the years have both enlightened me to new areas of research but it was my own research in a very different area of finance kept progressing. His, his continual push for looking at the environment when we're looking at important concepts about health, well-being, functioning, participation, and performance really resonated with me. His ideas have kept environment at the forefront. And he's also become one of the most prolific science communicators, communicators with an occupational therapy background. And as the one photo shows here, that uh, he's been on the cover of magazines uh, and publishing in many, many widely read mediums. And he's really getting OT and rehabilitation noticed. And the more I prepared for asking Robin to be a speaker, the more I found published about and, and by him. Uh, so there's many times cooking that I was listening to different YouTube videos of interviews you've done, Robin. But also one interesting one that if we can press uh, the next, just press enter who's controlling the screen. Robin also was a uh, co-organizer of Edmonton's largest snowball fight. So I don't know if he's going to touch on that of his speakership today, but maybe that's a presentation for another day. I found it to be very intriguing and very Winnipeg focused. Uh, I'm sure there's a few people that would love to know how you did it and the outcomes for when this pandemic is over. So Dr. Mazumder, I look forward to hearing from you and your presentation, Pushing Boundaries and Creating Space in Healthcare and Social Policy. Thank you, Robin. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. <clears throat> just checking, you can hear me okay? Okay, great. Let me just get my computer here. So 
I talked to Lisa last week um, and I, we decided that I would do something different um, and that I would improvise today. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but before I get into it, I'll make a land acknowledgement from where I am. I'm in Mexico City right now uh, in Coyoacan in uh, Mexico City and Mexico is named after the Mexica people, um, indigenous people. Uh, who lived in this area uh, along with the Aztecs and other and other indigenous peoples. And so while I'm not in Canada, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I really was quite upset by hearing about what happened with, re with the residential schools in BC. And I also want to acknowledge um, the lives lost uh, in Kamloops, but also everyone uh, in the history of Canada with the, the with the legacy of, uh, of, of uh, genocide. And so it's a very, very somber couple of weeks here, but I'm gonna try and uh, bring some hope. <laughs> so uh, I'll start. So what I'm doing is I wrote a, a, an outline here and I'm gonna bounce around and tell a story about my life. And in the process, uh, try to have a conversation about how we change uh, disciplines, um, systems, um, healthcare systems, cities, uh, and by the end, hopefully you can have a conversation. So I'm going to try and keep it uh, to about 40 minutes. Lisa, how, how long do you have? Because you said you have a bit of extra time. 40 minutes is fine. We technically the eliminate speakership ends the, at one, but we do have a 15 minute break after this for the symposium. So if it goes over a bit over one, it should be okay. Okay, great. I'm just going to keep the time here. So it's 12, 11. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by just talking about where I'm from. Uh, I grew up in Victoria, BC. Uh, my parents, a sit and shop, and I think might be watching. Um, and they're both scientists. My dad's a, a, an aquatic ecologist and a biologist and a fishery scientist, and actually does quite a lot of work with indigenous peoples um, up north looking at water quality. <clears throat> so I grew up in, oh, Lisa, I think, I don't know what happened here. Is my uh, camera still on? Yes, it is. Okay, okay, because I can only see yours, sorry. Uh, so I, I grew up in a lab, um, and in that lab, my mom uh, worked there as well. She's a chemist. So I grew up uh, looking at ecosystems, um, and actually my first job was collecting water quality samples uh, out in the Souk Reservoir in Victoria. Um, really lucky my dad gave me that opportunity. And that's really where I started to think about the world as an ecosystem, um, and that lens, I think, has really permeated everything I've done ever since. I um, went to the University of Victoria. I did my undergrad in biology, and I did that with the intention to do my uh, medical degree. Um, everyone I knew um, in my biology program took all the prereqs, and that was kind of the plan. But along at the same time, I started a co-op um, uh, placement as part of my biology undergrad, and that placement was really what got me started on this track in rehab because I worked for an, for an organization. I started volunteering with them and then it turned to a job uh, called Recreation Integration Victoria. And their role was really to facilitate the inclusion of youth with disabilities within summer camps. Uh, and uh, it was a very fascinating experience for me to have that experience uh, working with, with these kids while doing classes in molecular biology. Um, and so over the course of my undergrad, I really focused most of my time when I wasn't in school doing after school programs. And that's when I really started learning, learning about occupational therapy in a very kind of um, removed way. I knew the kids I worked with had OTs, but I didn't know too much about it. So when I finished my undergrad, I ended up uh, randomly winning a $10,000 um, Canadian International Development Agency fund. Uh, with my one of my best friends, Sean, uh, who did his degree in Russian and Slavonic studies at UVic. And he came to me and asked me if I wanted to apply for this grant to go work with kids in Russia. At that point, we really hadn't had um, much of a plan. We just made something up because he had a friend who lived in Kanti Mansis, which is in northern Siberia, who knew about an orphanage there. And uh, she said that there were children with disabilities who lived at this orphanage. So we thought we would go over and try to do an inclusion program for these kids in Siberia. Um, and we ended up getting the money, so I spent much the summer right after my undergrad uh, living in Northern Siberia, uh, working with kids with disabilities and learning a lot about 
uh, the challenges that people face um, in other kind of cultural contexts, uh, Russia at that time, and I'm not sure where it's, what it's at, what it's like today, but it wasn't a particularly friendly place for kids with disabilities. And so a lot of these families lived at this orphanage so in isolation and quite alone. And so over the course of that summer, Sean and I just, uh, first we had to find the families because they weren't, uh, no one really wanted to talk about it. No one, no one in government wanted to talk about it. Um, the orphanage that we had planned to work with, the kids ended up actually not being there. They were in Sochi. So we had to kind of start start from scratch and find this community of parents of children with disabilities. Uh, and at the end of the summer, we ended up actually, I think it was a successful program. The parents said they felt safer in the, in the community. And, and since our departure, they started a community where they connected with other parents. And when I came back, I uh, got a job as a research analyst at Canassist, which is an assistive technology nonprofit organization at the University of Victoria. And my job there was as a research analyst to look at best practices in um, uh, supported, work, uh, supported workplace programs for youth. Uh, but while I was there, the executive director, his name is Nigel Livingston, said that, hey, you look like you look, you seem like someone who really uh, enjoys working with people. Um, and I think you'd be a great occupational therapist. And now I, th I think it was in September um of 2010 and i had no idea what occupational therapy was and i rapidly um uh, applied to the program so i think the deadline was in like november or december googling what ot was as i was writing my essays and miraculously got into the university of toronto which i wasn't expecting mm -hmm. because um my marks uh <laughs> is from my first year in, in, in uh, undergrad when I take biochem and biology and all these classes involving rote memorization weren't the best. So I was actually quite surprised that I got into U of T and then that changed my life. So occupational therapy um, and the OT education really made me start to, th made me start to think, you know, about you know occupation as a means to well-being, but also as Lisa had mentioned earlier about the influence of the environment. And the classes we took exposed us to um, you know the COPM, um, the CMOP, but particularly the the PEO, uh, which was taught to me by uh, the late Dr. Patty Rigby, uh, really, 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 really just rocked my world because I started to see this. Uh, ecosystem, which is something that was, you know, a part of my childhood. And I saw this interplay between the environment and, and people and what they did. And I was also particularly interested in mental health. So the majority of my placements really focused um, on mental health. I worked at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and Forensics in inpatient psychiatry, or sorry, inpatient schizophrenia. And I also worked at a boarding home named um, St. George House. And that was my last placement. And it was an independent placement. And in that role, it was really like the, the launching point because it was an ind independent placement. Um, I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with clients who were actually quite compromised um, in and out of, um, you know, CAMH. And that's when I started wondering about this transition between the institution and, 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 this, and the, the home, which was within the context of the city in Toronto. And considering these environmental variables, when someone's in the hospital and they're acutely psychotic and you spend about a month helping them stabilize, how do you get them from that institutional setting back to the community? And what parts of the community um, are, are supportive of their well-being from that environmental perspective and what parts were inhibiting that? Uh, and soon after my uh, getting my OT degree in 2011, I got my first job at the inpatient unit at CAMH in their schizophrenia unit. And that was really baptism by fire. My placements had pre uh, um, prepared me quite a bit, but there's, uh, I learned a lot. And that interest in the environmental context grew and grew. Uh, I moved to Edmonton. I worked in uh, a pediatric mental health clinic for kids with ADHD. Again, thinking about that environmental lens using the PEO and really uh, framed the work that I did. I was a mental health therapist. I wasn't um, officially an occupational therapist, but I used my OT lens. And then I started a job, which was really the big, um, I think, turning point in what brought me to my research. And that was working for a team called the COAST team, so the uh, Community Outreach Assessment and Support Team. And it was a multi, 
sector uh, collaboration between the Ministry of Environment, or sorry, the Ministry of uh, Persons with Developmental Disabilities, um, the Ministry of Justice. Uh, we work with people with addictions issues, but most of our clients had a developmental disability, a mental illness, uh, some some justice system involvement, and were expressing uh, challenging behaviors. And so. Um, Challenging behaviors was basically the term for when people weren't able to communicate their needs and uh, got frustrated and then would um, assault their caregivers, either their uh, their family or, or paid, giver, pair, paid caregivers. And so I worked with both uh, forms of caregivers to help them understand what was happening for the for the clients I was serving. And, Really trying to give them some opportunities to 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 experience joy because fundamentally most of the people that i worked with lived quite isolated they lived on the fringes of the city and boarding homes where a lot of these um private uh companies operated them and regardless of the you know uh diagnoses that they had what i saw as kind of the most detrimental and pervasive issue was that they were terribly lonely um, and I would go in there, you know, uh, on our team, we had psychiatrists, nurses, uh, three OTs, OTAs, uh, behavioral uh, analysts, um, and really the, the client that really moved me to, to, to start to examine these questions in more depth, um, he was recommended, uh, I was recommended to see him by the psychiatrist or seen because he had attempted suicide. And, uh, you know, so I went to meet with him and, and tried to gently ask what it was that made him consider that. And he just said, I'm lonely. Um, I don't have any friends and there's no point. All I do is watch TV all day and I never leave my house. I was like, well, let's leave your house and go for a walk and see if we can find places for you to connect with people. And that's when it became very, very apparent to me that this issue um, that I saw as, as an issue of healthcare or the healthcare system was really one that was a product of a, a, a disabling environment. You know, and I use the word disabling environment because the social model of disability was something that we learned at U of T. I think it's probably evolved into something else since then, but that really showed me the distinction um, between locating illness and disability within the person um, and really understanding how the environment contributes to that disability. And when I used that lens to work with this person who uh, came close to taking their own life, I saw that there was only so much, you know, I could do on, on a personal level for, for from, from the perspective of intervention for the person and wanted to explore ways to, to do that uh, from a community and an, and an urban design perspective. And while I was working in Edmonton as an OT, I was quite involved in the community. As uh, Lisa mentioned, it landed me on, <laughs> on a magazine, which was an interesting experience for that one month. Uh, I felt like a mini celebrity. <laughs> I was just like, I'm just an OT. Not just an OT, OTs are great. But, you know, um, it was an interesting time. And, and one of the things um, that landed, I think, uh, me with that opportunity. My friend had my friend uh, Jason nominated me, but at the time I was doing lots of um, urban design or um, pop up uh, projects like uh, pop up bike lanes, uh, advocacy, activism. Um, I, I I launched that snowball fight uh, that Lisa mentioned, which was really um, a random thing where uh, me and a stranger at the time were tweeting back and forth about how we wanted to have a snowball fight because it was October and it had started snowing in Edmonton and I was trying to find something to look forward to because at that point, I didn't really like snow that much. Um, and uh, we we ended up having a snowball fight for 3,000 people. Anyways, all these things were happening, um, which then led me to be to be invited to be on the city of Edmonton, uh, Mayor Don Iveson's uh, and Poverty Task Force. And I co-chaired the, co uh, the community uh, well-being cohort, sorry, the community well-being working group. I was a co-chair of that with Dr. Maria Mayan, who's a community engaged researcher at the U of A. And that's when I started to see, I was having these clients that were terribly lonely and lived in parts of Edmonton um, that where there was a lot of poverty. Um, and I tried to advocate for some inquiry into how the design of the city and what, what the jurisdiction and, and, and the power that the city had as a municipality, what they could do to address 
uh, something that I was struggling with as someone who was part of the healthcare system. Um, and so that led me to uh, all sorts of really interesting uh, collaborations and connections with people who worked in the tech space. And I uh, ended up leaving occupational therapy to run a startup accelerator for a year uh, at, at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. Totally random. You would think, why would someone without a business background and a healthcare professional run a startup accelerator? But I was just really interested in, in, in ideation and, and iteration. And since then, I've been involved with some startups. Um, and there was one course that I had to take as part of my training for this position, and that was with the Stanford Design School, the D School. And the D School is really one of the originators of design thinking, and uh, they work closely with IDEO, who created you know, the Apple iPhone. And this design thinking process uh, basically is a cycle that involves uh, empathizing with, a, with the client or with the user of the product using that empathy really to inform what the needs are. A lot of people create products or start companies or, or, or make things thinking the world needs it without really asking that question. And then they try to force people to use it, use it. And then the startup kind of fails. So that empathy step really connected with me um, when I was thinking about this intersection between urban design and well-being, because I consider the clients I was working with and whether they had really been empathized with um, in the design of the community that they lived in. And so I then, around that time, had read an article. I was on Twitter and saw an article about how boring cities are bad for your mental health. And I thought it was a brilliant article. And I looked up who wrote it. And I saw that it was Dr. Colin Ellard, uh, who was a neuroscientist at the University of Waterloo. I never took a class in neuroscience. I think I took one class in psych, but I sent him an email and said, hey, uh, I'm an occupational therapist. I uh, have a master's in occupational therapy. I'm really interested in looking at this question of how cities can support or inhibit mental health. Uh, what do you think? Can I do a PhD with you? And he said, yes. Uh, can you start in two months? So, <laughs> so you know, that's, that's kind of how I roll. Um, you know, when a really good opportunity comes up, I jump on it. And that's what led me to, to the University of Waterloo, where I did my PhD using uh, wearable technology, things that measure your heart rate, your blood pressure, your galvanic skin response. The galvanic skin response is also known as, the electro, as, as electrodermal activity, which is essentially your rate of emotional sweat. And that was the main variable I, I used uh, to measure people's um, emotional responses to, to different urban environments. And so over the course of my PhD, I ran experiments in um, collaboration with the city of Vancouver in the happy city consultancy and an urban planning uh, urban design firm called um, modus and we looked at how you know paint in cities um, like a, a rainbow crosswalk we did a study in Davy village which is which is the queer neighborhood in Vancouver and we looked at things like rainbow crosswalks and what that would do to your to your uh, sense of uh, happiness and your desire to connect with people. We looked at what green spaces did. We looked at what community gardens did. And I did that research on the side. Uh, but my the focus of my dissertation was looking at the experience that people had when they were surrounded by tall buildings. Um, skyscrapers are a defining um, attribute of urban centers. They're being built at an unprecedented, unprecedented rate. They're seen as a solution to urban densification. Um, but a lot of sociological um, critiques, um, Parker particularly, who I think is at Sheffield in the UK, talks about skyscrapers being capital made durable in places where very, very wealthy people store their money to the detriment of the people around these, these places because these buildings typically aren't too porous on the ground level. So their facades are mostly banks and you can't really engage with it. And so all of these aspects of these buildings, which are, are kind of seen as the saviors of the modern city create an aesthetic and an experience that can be uncomfortable for people. And so my PhD really focused at looking at that. We did it in the real world. I did um, one of my biggest studies when I was uh, I, one of two fellowships to, to, to study at, at the University of College London in, in, in London, UK. And I took people out of the city and uh, measured their responses, their psychological and physiological responses. But that type of uh, field uh, research is is quite difficult. Um, 
there's all sorts of organizational issues. And the other aspect to consider when it comes to psychological research is, is ecological validity. So, you know, um, we tried building these 3D uh, models of, of cities and to place people in VR to have more uh, control over, um, you know, ensuring the signal of these uh, physiological um, responses was was a lot cleaner because when you're in the city, you're wearing something like an like an like a, like a watch, and it's not that great of a connection. So what we did was to maintain ecological validity of these environments, of these ecosystems that I was studying, we actually used a 360 degree uh, video camera and then placed that in VR. So we took people in the real world in London and then we took a video of that and took that video back to Waterloo, placed it in VR. And I was able to run many more participants and increase my statistical power. And I'm not gonna bore you with the stats, but um, over the course of the studies, I found that people did find these 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 settings very uncomfortable, and then I started to synthesize and look at uh, research from from sociology, as I mentioned, anthropology, um, uh, computer science, uh, evolutionary biology, uh, comparative neuroscience, and all of these are just kind of buzzwords uh, <laughs> to, to, for the most part. But I think uh, this the integration of, of those different perspectives really allowed me to understand the evolutionary psychology involved in the environmental psychology of cities. And what was interesting about it was that mammals share um, the, a threat response system. And so when you look at animal studies, there's this response that animals have to looming uh, objects uh, that they just get um, uh, quite stressed out because it, it it triggers this feeling of some sort of predator. And some people think that humans and, and babies particularly um, can demonstrate these similar kind of responses. So there's an unconscious response to the built environment of our city. That's the thesis of my thesis. Um, and since then, I've developed a theory called uh, experiential equity, um, which really builds on, on this, this question of how does living in a city affect your well-being? And uh, the reason that I moved into experiential equity, I, I was just finishing my PhD, it was the pandemic. Uh, it is the pandemic, but it was like the pandemic had just started. <laughs> I hope it will end soon. I really, really do. Um, I know we all do. Um, but I was asked to contribute to a textbook on urban design responses to the pandemic. Uh, to, to talk about you know my perspective on on urban issues, but this textbook was really is really focused and it's coming out as being <clears throat> published by Policy Press. I think it's coming out in, in a month or two. Um, this textbook is really focused on using an, a lens of equity and, and social justice, and at this intersection of the pandemic um, and the Black Lives Matter Matter movement. Um, I saw an intersection between uh, space, uh, place, and race, um, and how design itself will not solve the problems of our society. You know, building bike lanes aren't going to erase racism. Um, good parks uh, might be considered to be, you know, spaces of well-being, but for particular people. Um, and I say this as a dark skinned person of color. I've been in parks before where I've had to deal with racists and all sorts of, you know, other forms of harassment. And I have privilege. I'm a man. So I started to think of th a cisgendered uh, man. And so I'm I started thinking about how these kind of complexities of your identity and how you're perceived by other people. And then the response that you get from these other people really add a layer on top of the way that, you know, the urban landscape is experienced, um, you know, or I'm. A few months before, right at the beginning of the pandemic, there was Christian Cooper who was had the police, police call on him because he was birding in, in Central Park and uh, had asked a woman to not let her dog, uh, you know, harass these rare birds that were living in this bird sanctuary. And so there's, you know, many, 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 many examples of how policing in public space um, really influences, uh, you know, people's stress. And so I used uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality theory. Kimberly Crenshaw, if you're not familiar with her, was a black legal scholar who did some research in the late uh, 1980s uh, looking at the effect uh, of race on income uh, in, an in, uh, in an industrial kind of uh, warehouse. Um, and 
uh, what she found was that actually, you know, gender uh, amplified the disparity um, that was already there from race. And so that led her to develop intersectionality theory, where she posits that based on your identity, where you experience marginalization, whether you're a woman or a trans person or a black person or an indigenous person, um, how how being those having those um, labels um, really contributes to your, your experience of uh, oppression and marginalization. And so building on intersectionality theory, I read also, and not really building on, really combining it, W.E.B. Du Bois was a black sociologist and in 1897 wrote this piece for the Atlantic uh, magazine on what he called double consciousness. And imagine being a black sociologist, sociologist with a PhD, you know, just at the turn of, of, of the 1900s. And so he wrote about what it was like to be a black person in American society. And he he referred to it as double consciousness or two-ness. And essentially he spoke to having to keep in the back of your mind, the fact that you are a black person in a racist society. And so your experience of just life doesn't only involve the typical stresses that the average, the average person does or the, the non-marginalized or oppressed person does, but there's an added layer. So considering someone's intersectional identity with this concept of two-ness and this cognitive burden of double consciousness, uh, I read some work by someone named Dr. Rodney Clark who did research on racism-related vigilance. And he found that Black and Hispanic people in the United States actually have higher arterial elasticity um, and all sorts of other kind of issues that are associated with the vigilance that is attached to experiencing or anticipating racism in cities. So using that kind of foundation with my, my background, using wearable technology and understanding how people experience cities, um, I propose that we as a community and, a, and a, as a collective, you know, try to find ways to, to measure these disparities using neuroscience so that we can finally actually acknowledge these experiences that are, that are often dismissed and gaslighted by, by some people in our society. So that's a bit of a summary of, you know, what, where I'm from, what I've been doing, uh, you know, my educational and my academic background. But Lisa asked me to talk about, you know, uh, how do you push boundaries in, in healthcare and social policy? And, I mean, I, in my experience, um, sometimes I push boundaries and I don't really know I'm doing them. <laughs> uh, and so I catch myself in these kind of in these places where, uh, you know, there's a mix of, of people from very different backgrounds having conversations about cities. Um, and if I was to make some uh, suggestions for the students watching this, you know, it's how do you place yourself in positions where you can bring the occupational lens that you've learned a lot about in your in your masters um, to problems that you know uh, that you may not see OT as part of, but you know I've heard all sorts of you know taglines for OT, you know the skills for everyday life, everyday living. I think um, Lisa mentioned something the other day about this idea of everyday living, what you do, who you love what you what you love and where you live i think something like that but <laughs> um but you can correct me after lisa but if you consider that then that then occupational therapy and occupational science really encapsulates all of human life <laughs> and we probably have an opinion about everything from um you know doing using task analysis for analysis for how someone can uh you know board a bus properly um, to what kinds of questions municipal leaders like mayors or policymakers need to ask to ensure that, you know, people can engage in their meaningful occupations within the context of the city. So my route was really just, and you know, saying yes to, <clears throat> you know, uh, people asking me to, to volunteer for boards or starting to volunteer and then getting your, your name out there and letting people know really about what you, what you do, what you're interested in. Um, and then I think a lot of really interesting um, connections can come up. And that's where I think the boundaries can be pushed. I think the when we consider a boundary uh, with a, of a discipline um, and role blurring and, and line blurring between, uh, you know, something like, like OT and social work, you have to understand the constraints of what your profession is. And I think frames of reference and um, 
models can help guide practice and remind you what it is that you're doing as an occupational therapist. But equally important, I think, is how you bridge those gaps and then push for new um, for new roles. I know that at U of T, there was like an emerging OT uh, role uh, placement where they would put an OT uh, student in something. I don't know. At that time, I think addictions was something that OTs were just getting into. And I can't remember her, remember her last name, but Anushka at CAMH was like the first um, OT who worked in addictions. And since then, now there's there's a many, many OTs that work in addictions. So it's, it's trying to figure out ways to kind of enter uh, spaces uh, that don't have people who think or, or look like you and then trying to find ways to, to facilitate uh, collaborations. Uh, and then, and then you might have yourself a, a job in, a, in an area that never had an OT, but uh, you know, as someone who left clinical practice, I think, you know, if you're interested in, in academia, you know, I, I chose cognitive neuroscience and, and what's interesting is over the course of my PhD and all the classes I had to take, I always saw the OT lens. I took a class on mind wandering uh, and, and intention and, uh, and flow. You know, uh, we, we, we read about Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who I know a lot about OTs love. We talked about him at U of T. And so when you place yourself in these different areas and you still have that OT lens, that's how you can build these bridges and do research projects that combine fields that have, you know, never really involved OTs. Um, see my time's like, it's 12 for it. Um, so I think that, you know, it's, it's it, as Lisa mentioned at the beginning, it's a really challenging time for us as a country. Um, we have to really consider, I think, I think, I think our first priority um, should be reconciliation um, at every level. I think that when it comes to pushing boundaries or, or innovating, you know, I'm less interested in some cool, uh, you know, some interesting technological innovation than I am in how we can start to move forward as a country and ensure that Indigenous peoples have what they need to live healthy lives and that, that we see more Indigenous peoples as OTs. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that we need to find ways to expand what occupational therapy is about, maybe challenge some of what you know, the history we have on optimization and independence, um, recognize different worldviews on how, what health looks like. Um, the Western medical model is, is very helpful, but it's also limited in, 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 in how it conceptualizes well-being and, and also the role that the family and the collective plays. We live in a melting pot country. Um, we live in a country with people with many from many different backgrounds. And so I think that the, the healthcare system and the, and the social policy of the future really has to appreciate those differences of experiences, which is what I look at with experiential equity, um, and, and then make space, you know, for, for, different, uh, for different types of OTs, for different types of researchers, and for the experiences of your clients who might have had lives that you have not, that, that, you, that they have, might, have, might have lived lives that you don't understand. Um, and so cultural competency and, um, uh, you know, really pulling from critical race theory and people like uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, I think, can set us up uh, to move forward in a way that ensures that occupational therapists and occupational scientists and educators and, you know, the OTs of the future who are watching this, that we can really, um, you know, meet the needs of of this evolving, uh, rapidly changing population and, and aging population. So I've just said a lot there. Um, it's twelve forty-three. At least how does seventeen minutes sound for questions? And I can I can talk more. <laughs> that sounds really great, Robin. I feel like I've been taken back to the kind of old school academic lecture, and I really enjoyed it. Oh, really? Great. I was trying to do something new. <laughs> <laughs> It has been a while since I've not seen a PowerPoint presentation and I loved it. So I hope everyone else did too, but we'll just open it up for uh, questions. If anyone has any questions uh, for Robin and his very varied uh, history of what got him here. And I think why I love what you talked about is just what the opportunities are uh, for our students who are going out as new OTs after their last field work this summer, um, just going out there and, 
and, and not accepting just what there is, but really pushing for what there could be. So anyone have any questions for Robin? Well, Lisa, I have some, some comments, but I can wait for students to ask questions too. Oh, go ahead, Sophia. We have plenty of time. Uh, and I know when Robin and I, when Robin and I met last week, we both said we could end up talking for hours. So we kind of had to like cut off our time. So go ahead, Sophia. And uh, um, and if anyone else has questions asked, if you just put your name in the chat, then we can make sure that we know how many people have questions. Um, yeah, I just want to say, uh, Robin, thank you for the presentation. It really made me think a lot. Um, I'm an OT in a psychiatric hospital here in Winnipeg. Um, and I work on the inpatient units. So I was just kind of reflecting as we were talking about urban spaces, how all of my indigenous clients have like, well, no, not all of them. Some of them live in the city, but a lot of clients I have that are flown in from up north and how, how jarring that is to kind of like suddenly be in this urban center from having lived on a reserve or um, a landscape that was completely different and how um, here in the hospital, like indigenous women giving birth are flown in from their, from their communities and like that life event is happening in a different, like in an urban cent center that they're not used to and kind of, it just got me reflecting on, on how that would impact their mental health as well, kind of that displacement that happens all the time. Um, and I liked what you said about pushing boundaries. I've been reflecting since this uh, residential school news came out and, and always, I'm reflecting a lot on my work with Indigenous people and I've met even some survivors this week who aren't doing well. Um, and so it's, I like what you said about like, just trying to understand, trying to understand uh, people whose lived experience is different than yours. Cause you know, I'm asked to assess their function and their life has been completely different than mine. So it's just kind of sitting back and, and listening to them. And also just reflecting on how we can push boundaries in, in jobs that are already OT heavy, like how I can even just push boundaries in the hospital that has lots of OTs and lots of OT jobs without having, I don't have to create a new OT role, but I can certainly push boundaries and try and change things right here at home. Uh, so those are just some of my reflections. <laughs> wow. Uh Lisa, can I respond to the reflections? Yeah. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I, so I have a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, first of all, um, I mean, you don't need, you don't do easy work. So thank you. Um, and it was interesting when I was living in Edmonton, <clears throat> Edmonton at the time, I mean, I moved there in 20, 12 yeah 2012 and I uh when I was working on the coast team on the community outreach team I was actually working quite closely with Alberta Hospital Edmonton and um and at that time the city was I think actually approaching Winnipeg uh, for for having you know the highest number of urban indigenous uh residents or something like it was a it was a big thing people were talking about it so they had an indigenous newcomer center and i thought that was very interesting because i never even thought about that as being an issue you know as you said like i it's it's hard to know other people's experiences and so um i so after that i started paying attention on, on the poverty task force we had an indigenous roundtable so it was really something that was a big part of um, my life and uh, you know I was also teaching part-time at McEwen as a sessional instructor in the occupational therapy assistant program and they had just introduced Indian Horse by uh, Richard Wagamese that year as the book of the year at McEwen which if, in, if people haven't read it I highly encourage you at particularly this time um, and we had the TRC hearings of 2014 so I uh, and I attended them and <clears throat> I was very lucky to have the support of an elder who was also an employee at Alberta Hospital Edmonton named um, Emil Duroche. And he invited me out 
to go on some sweats um, with him and his and the clients that he served at Alberta Hospital Edmonton, some of whom were inpatient clients and some of whom were outpatient clients. Um, and that just kind of that just changed how I saw everything. Um, and you know the, the notion of the medicine, medicine wheel, the, the the concept of the circle, this concept of connection to the land. You know, these are all things that <clears throat> environmental psychologists, you know, have turned into theories, but Indigenous people have known quite in, intuitively <laughs> for millennia. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that I'm still learning more. You know, like one of the conversations I think that that are really important when it comes to these. Uh, when, when I talk about racism or when I talk about, you know, where my family's from, my dad's from Bangladesh and he survived a genocide, no one really knows about that. And it's not people's fault. Um, however, as educators and people who work in um, healthcare, who are also educators, psychoeducation or whatever you want to call it, is, is, is a really big part of, of being an OT. Um, so I would, you know, a... It's 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 a it's a, it's, a, it's a massive issue. But as healthcare professionals, I think just continue to learn. Um, if if there are other things like the TRC hearings, if there are ways to connect with Indigenous elders uh, who work with the hospitals, um, it's it's such an amazing resource, um, and it's 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 a lifelong process. So I'm rambling a bit, but you gave me a lot to think about, and um, and I appreciate your comments. We also have a question in the chat, um, so I can read that out, by Olson Jarvis. So I like the perspective you brought from W.E.B. Dubois. As a person of African descent and considering the response of people to the urban environment, what are your thoughts of removing statues of people who have been negatively associated with the past? Uh, thank you for the question. I think we just need to take them out and move on. Um, I think that, you know, there are a lot of the arguments are, well, you have to remember your history and these statues are, this is a very political conversation. <laughs> I'm really kind of bearing, you know, my, my, my stance on these issues, but, um, uh, you know, uh, doctors take the Hippocratic oath, you know, do no harm. And in, in our modern society, you know, it, it, people say people are complaining about everything and, you're harmed by everything and they call people snowflakes but these are really these are legacies of, 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 of genocide and oppression and I think that we should remove them I saw that in Edmonton uh, Mayor Iveson um, uh, I think put forward a motion to remove um, uh, a mural of Grandin at Grandin Station and replace that with Indigenous art and I think a, a giant orange um just a, just a big giant orange board in commemoration of the children. So, you know, people are doing it across cities. I think that we can be creative in how we can repurpose these spaces. And if if the people who think that statues are the only way that you learn about history, uh, <laughs> you know, we can we can um, we can learn about what happened in the past without having um, you know relics of of violence in in, in the midst of our experiences of, of daily life in the city. I can't hear you for talking to someone. Oh, it's giving me a lot to think about as well. Um, but just opening it up to, uh, oh, can I comment? Of course, Olson. Hi, uh, thanks for a great presentation. I, I guess you're hearing me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do. I do agree. There's lots of ways to learn history. I guess the, the, my wife and I have had this conversation quite a bit. Um, we're, we're both of African descent, and I guess the one part we're kind of struggling with is when we take these strat statues away. How do we prevent people from bringing? We just lost uh, your sound oh, okay. lost about five seconds ago. So how yeah. do we prevent? Uh, how do how do we prevent people from coming back in the future and saying, "Hey, this guy was great," and it's not like these people all, did all bad things, but there was just like their legacy was a lot of times bad. 
And how do we make sure that when people want to bring these things back, we say, hey, no, 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 we took this down because. And I guess the concern is once these things are gone, um, you know, how do we make sure that the um, the education and the legacy of why we took them down goes away? I completely support getting rid of Bishop Brandon Boulevard because it is kind of like you can't get around Southern Winnipeg without it. But certain statues, how do we make sure that, hey, you know what, if someone starts a movement to bring this back, we got to remember, no, we took this down because. Robin, you're just muted. <laughs> Sorry, it's like my 9 million Zoom and I still mute myself. Um, Olson, thanks for that, for that question. I really appreciate you sharing your perspective on this. Um, I think that, I mean, con context is extremely important. Um, you know, a lot of people from these, uh, you know, these eras uh, did some really terrible things. And, um, you know, some politicians have said that we have to, we have to consider that context and that, you know, everyone was kind of evil at that time or, or whatever. But, um, so I think we have to really understand where these kind of thoughts came from. At the same time, I do think we have to remove these these um, reminders of these of these histories. But in terms of how you go about addressing the education, um, I have an example from Tulsa. Um, a few a few weeks ago, I was invited to give a keynote at the for the for an urban planning conference that was really intended to commemorate the Tulsa Race Massacre, which if people aren't familiar with, I would encourage you to look it up. It's not an easy thing to learn about, but essentially in 1921, um, a community of freed slaves who actually built a really wonderful urban center in Tulsa, um, in Greenwood, um, had it burnt down essentially by the KKK and the police and many, many people were murdered. And it's a, it's a part of America's history that people don't know, know much about in America, let alone in Canada. But since then, they have really uh, moved they're trying to move forward as a, as a community and engage in reconciliation. And there's a museum and an art space being built to commemorate it. But that's a, you know, that's a multi-million dollar project, but um, they also have street art, you know, uh, they have a piece of art that says uh, black wall street. And um, there was actually an, a, a, a teacher I was reading about, <clears throat> about this mural um, in the Tulsa uh, Oklahoma newspaper to understand what, you know, really the, the the scene there because I can physically go there because of the pandemic. But um, this teacher said that, you know, when I'm walking around, I took my, my students on a field trip and we went to this mural and you can use art to, um, to tell a story that's, you know, you can bring beauty to public space and tell a story about what happened somewhere. And so I think when we take these, you know, hopefully when we take these, these statues down, we can put art in its place that compensate for the perhaps centuries of the absence of, of, of the narrative that really is what's embedded in that landscape. Um, and in, uh, there's a trend in Canada. Um, when I was, I gave a talk in Saskatoon a few years ago for the, for their design festival. And I met uh, someone who was in, engaged with uh, indigenous placemaking. You know, uh, what does indigenous placemaking look like? Placemaking is a term in urban design uh, practice that involves, you know, using art or some kind of, you know, um, structural uh, intervention to create a sense of place. Um, and so, so I think it, the storytelling will always be necessary, um, I think orally, but I think there are ways for us to leave, um, you know, memorials to, 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 to lives lost and lives affected by these legacies. And I think we can make it beautiful. And just connecting with your research, probably less of a stress response than what we currently have <laughs> accessing these spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a couple comments um, that I'll use to wrap up. Uh, Lois has put with the pandemic and so socially isolating in homes, Many are needing green space and moving to homes that are, have yards instead of having apartments with or without the balcony, but real, real estate sale of homes has gone to the seller's market then. So we have these other economic consequences, which really I think 
brings us back to the beginning, Lois, about why I was so drawn to Robin's work and have been following his work, um, even though mine seems in finance and health seems so diverse uh, from Robin's work, but I think it really sets this foundation. Um, Dr. Patty Till, or Phil has put in there that she hosts an urban an urbanism book club four times a year, and she provided her email address there if anyone in the audience is interested. Um, and we had a typo. And Patty also said, thank you for an excellent talk showing the strength of transdisciplinary approaches and taking risks, bringing our strengths and learning within or with communities in different spaces. And Olson uh, responded, using art as a form of depicting the story, like it, me as well. Um, and Maya said, thank you. As a soon to be OT, it was so cool to hear how you brought the OT lens to different areas of study like design and human geography or geo and gives me lots to think about. And Maya, thank you, because I was, that was my hope is inviting Robin here, because I've been listening and watching his his own career develop um, so, through social media. Sounds kind of creepy, but it's how we do things nowadays. Um, oh, it's, so <laughs> it's one o'clock. Um, this uh, Masters of Research or Masters of OT Research Symposium will start again uh, with presentations on different links from this one at 1.15 and otherwise, Robin, I'd love to thank you for this presentation. Um, it really did take me back to kind of what my old school idea of academia was of listening to someone's story and, and knowledge. And we're getting a lot of thank yous uh, in the chat. And uh, I'm looking forward to keeping in contact. And uh, I think the best way to contact you is through Twitter. Is that not correct? Um, yeah, I mean, send me an email, I think is probably best. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. But I if can't... the students or anything are wanting to follow you, or you also have a web page as well. Yeah, robinmazender.com. Um, it has all my contact info on there and a contact form. So you can just send me an email. But yeah, follow me on Twitter um, and tag me in, in things that you think I might find interesting. If you ever have any questions, please let, please let me know. Uh, I remember the feeling of, 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 of approaching the end of my OT degree. It's an extremely exciting time. I'm uh, I'm really proud of everyone here. Finishing an OT degree during a pandemic is not easy. Um, doing anything during a pandemic is not easy, but that's a particularly impressive feat. So thanks again, Lisa. Thank you to the College of Rehab Sciences and everyone who, who attended today and get in touch if I can help them. Perfect. Thank you. And all the best uh, as you finish up your stay in Mexico and uh, come back to Canada at some point. We'll very see. soon. Very soon. I think by the end of the month. Just been okay. <laughs> okay. It's now warm up here, so you can come back. Basically. Perfect. Okay. Thanks all right. Okay. Have a really great day. Hey, you too. Thanks, Lisa. Bye.